I'm an entrepreneur. I've been one my entire life. It's just who I am. It's in my core. I really don't remember a time when I didn't think entrepreneurial thoughts. Uh, I'm a change agent. I, I'm the kind of guy who sees the status quo and says, how do we disrupt that in the most radical sort of way? Uh, it's not really just innovation that I want to do. I, I want to transform things, anything that I can see in front of me. It's wanting to transform and change it for the better. I want to create really big solutions to really big problems that I think only I uniquely can see. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and all of these things are, are true about me. I think rules are really a good starting point for negotiating new rules. I think that achievement is what motivates me more than anything else. Autonomy is what I enjoy above all else, making an impact. Yes, and money also motivates me, but that's really never been at the top of the list of what drives my interests. See, entrepreneurs are catalysts. They define what's important and they redefine what's possible. All of these things are true about me because I've, and I know it because I've lived every single day of the last 25 years as an entrepreneur. And I recognize these traits whenever I read books and articles that are written about entrepreneurs, at least for as long as I can afford to pay attention to them before I get bored because I'm learning something that I already know and I want to go learn something new. I, I, I see all of these traits are common in my friends who are entrepreneurs. I've got a very high risk tolerance and a very, very low tolerance for frustration. I, I'm really nothing if not persistent. and I see failure as still just progress. I, I, everything up until this very moment on stage is just prelude for what comes next in my mind. I did my first real startup when I was 15 years old. I, I went out and found some customers to please. I hired my mom and eight or ten other people and we built a company. I've seriously tried dozens of ventures since then and I've seriously failed at many of them. I've made small fortunes and I've lost very big fortunes. I've enjoyed some real success. I've created jobs where none were. I've opened markets that nobody ever thought really existed before. I spent about half of my career over the last 10 years working in tech companies, and I've spent the other half doing social enterprises, a trade association, a business incubator, and most recently a charter school in the inner city focused on teaching future tech entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur. And this is just really how my brain is wired. Uh, these are the traits that I've witnessed with other people. And I'm sharing this with you today not to boast or to brag, but really just to give you some idea as to my perspective. When I tell you the most important part of the message, which is that the future of this country depends on the dramatic increase of more entrepreneurs from all walks of life. We have to do more to educate entrepreneurs. We have to completely change the way we educate all kids if we're going to create more entrepreneurs in this country. I, I can tell you that before designing this school, I really didn't think very much about what went into making me a lifelong entrepreneur. I really didn't consider all of those traits that I now recognize in so many of my friends who are entrepreneurs. Was I born this way? I, what experiences molded me to become an entrepreneur. Where did this entrepreneurial spirit really originate? Can all of this be taught in school? We're creating a, a high school to teach entrepreneurs. Is that even possible, really? The more involved I got into education, the, the more foreign I felt. I, I, I looked around and saw a world full of very, very well-meaning educators, but they were trapped in the least entrepreneurial system in America. I found public schools were all optimized towards uniform outcomes where innovation was incremental at best. Now, let me pause for a second, actually, because I'm not here to bash on teachers. I'm, I'm not here to preach the gospel of business leaders to ride to the rescue and be the salvation of the future of education. Realistically, we're just one of 3,500 charter schools that have been created 
and operate right now across the country. They educate a total of about a million kids in charter schools. And, and I'm not really here today to advocate for charter schools because, quite frankly, an awful lot of them are awful and don't really outperform some of their public school counterparts. This isn't really about administrators or teachers unions or politicians who, despite their absolute best efforts, have completely failed to really alter outcomes in a system that's really over 100 years old. I do have enormous respect, though, for educators. Over the last couple of years of building this school, I have learned one thing above all, and that is that this is an incredibly complex job and that educators are very highly skilled people when they do their job right. We spend $500 billion a year in this country educating 50 million kids in public school, K-12. to That's a hell of a lot of status in the status quo. There are entrenched interests everywhere. So what we need to think about now is what, as a country, we should expect from the public school system. I think we need to expect a complete and utter redefinition of what's possible. We have to think beyond the current rules and resources of public school education. And we have to expect far greater outcomes than the system is even capable of delivering today. This isn't just, by the way, about big city schools. This isn't about rural schools. This isn't about schools full of minorities and poor kids. It's not even just about failing schools. In fact, really, this is about all schools in America. The public education system, as we've heard tonight, is a hundred-year-old industry. It was created really as a relic of the industrial age. It was created to mass produce a productive labor with a certain degree of consistency, to make sure that America would have the labor pool that it needed to be able to compete in the industrial age. Well, that, that's long gone, and today's global knowledge economy, really success depends only on what you know, on, on your agility and your ability to reason, your ability to communicate, on divergent thought, really. The industrial age was slow and it had big, steady, slow-moving institutions. And so the public schools were perfect for producing that product. They created lots and lots of students to go to work for those big, slow-moving institutions that drove our economy in those days. But in the knowledge economy, the absolute only constant is change. And it's not really, when I say earlier that I found public schools to be the least entrepreneurial in environment in America. It's not just in the approach. It's not just in how we operate public schools. It was in the very lessons that we teach. C consider for a moment that the teacher is the producer of knowledge and that the student is the consumer of knowledge. It's the very opposite of a free market system in today's public school system. The producer in a planned economy sort of way, decides what the consumer should learn, how much the consumer wants, how the consumer is going to consume, and when the consumer's had enough. We're not even teaching in a basic fundamental way, in a way that inspires entrepreneurs. The central authority, the government, the school system, the teachers in the classroom, they get to decide all of that, not the students or not the consumers. The world's rapidly changed over the last decade. Kids consume knowledge on demand. It's at their fingertips. It's, it's untethered. They can, at any moment, really, find fresh understanding just a mouse click away. Kids today can go on a, their own self-directed path of learning if we just point them in the right direction. Yet, most schools still deliver a one-size-fits-all curriculum. It's at a pace for the most common denominator. These central planners that I talked about, they, they decide how you should consume, and whatever they decide, is, it's generally pretty identical to the kid sitting next to you. That learning style doesn't fit the entrepreneur. We need a nation full of entrepreneurial people. We need to do more to orient our schools in a way to crank those kids out. Our schools need to recognize and celebrate those traits that make an entrepreneur who they are instead of rewarding conformity. Think about high grades today in a typical school. They, they go for doing exactly what's expected of you. 
Usually there's just one acceptable answer to a question, no matter how complex that question might be. And the smarter kids, sooner or later, figure out how to give the teacher exactly what they want in order to be able to move forward. See, this isn't just about the, the students either. The teachers that try to think outside the box, they, they don't fare any better than the maverick students. Whenever a teacher encourages a kid to think differently or comes up with some kind of divergent curriculum, we criticize them for failing to prepare their students for what's next. Schools fear failure. They aren't set up to reward persistence. Entrepreneurs view failure differently. They, they see it just as a step towards the eventual success. If you fail the semester test in school, you don't get the chance to do it again and again and again until you master it. You simply fail. The system motivates kids by fear of failing the test and not by a love of achievement. In a typical classroom, there's a time limit on persistence. We have to create an education environment where the entrepreneurial spirit is fostered. We have to teach kids to control their own fate and to not accept their circumstances. We have to empower teachers and hold them accountable, not just whenever most of their students meet the minimum standards, but whenever all of their students master the standards. Entrepreneurs are adventurers. They take initiative and they risk conformity. How do you teach that in public school? So we came up with eight ways that that happens. The first is that you've got to reward effective risk-taking teachers. You've got to encourage them to tailor their classroom, their curriculum, their instruction method in ways that reinforce entrepreneurial behavior. The second thing is, is you have to infuse entrepreneurial curriculum throughout every aspect of the school. It's not enough to just teach entrepreneurship in a business class. You should be teaching entrepreneurship in science class. You should be teaching entrepreneurship in English class. It's got to be a total restructuring of the process and all of the teaching materials. The third thing we figured out is that you have to create regular experiences for these kids to experience uh, entrepreneurial behavior. The, the best predictor of future entrepreneurial success is past entrepreneurial experience, and we've got to give these kids those opportunities right now when they're in school. We also found that you have to prioritize those things that go into making up good entrepreneurs. You have to develop their leadership skills and their communication skills, their critical thinking. They have to be able to work with other people. Entrepreneurs have to inspire the people around them. And kids need to have those skills developed at the high school level. You have to teach all students, not just the ones that seem inclined towards entrepreneurship the importance of entrepreneurs in our country's history. You have to give them access to role models on a regular basis. You've got to empower these students to be consumers of knowledge. Give them some alternatives as to what they learn. Reward the kids who wander off the beaten path every once in a while. And you have to align the entrepreneurship lessons with some kind of vocational skill. It's not enough just to walk into the school and tell a kid, hey, you're going to be a future entrepreneur. I really don't care if the hard skills that are matched up with that are software development skills or auto mechanic skills. You've got to give those skills to them to allow them to be successful. And finally, you've got to dramatically raise expectations. We have to raise our expectations of the public school system, but but also we have to raise our expectations of these kids. The one thing that we've learned over the last few years is that expectations raise a child. And teaching that child how to set high expectations of themselves has been all of the secret to our success so far. So this isn't about creating a generation of small business owners. Hopefully by now you know that that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about cranking out a bunch of people who are going to go manage businesses. Some of the best entrepreneurial minds in our country's history had nothing to do with businesses, actually. If every one of us can take and learn how to think more creatively and be more risk-taking and be more open to change, then collectively we're going to be a more successful population. So tonight we've 
really advance two big ideas that I want to recap. The first one is that we have to encourage the disruptive force of entrepreneurs into the public school system. You need lots and lots more people like me who come in and aren't intimidated by the enormity of the problem, that really aren't frustrated by the shortage of the resources. We need people inside the system to learn how to be more entrepreneurial and to take action. The second thing is we've got to unleash an entire generation of entrepreneurs in this country. And that's really the bigger idea. That if we orient education around encouraging and fostering entrepreneurial thinking, that we're going to unleash generations of people who will advance our country in ways that we can't even imagine to make us more competitive on a global scale, but also to solve problems that we don't see today. You see, entrepreneurs solve problems that they see, what's in front of them, the ones that they understand. We chose to build a school in Chicago's inner city. We did that because we wanted to prove that if you went in the most difficult conditions with some of the most at-risk students, that you could still implement this kind of a teaching method and instruction and be successful. The school that I serve is an open enrollment school. There's a huge disparity between the students who come in as freshmen. Some come to us ready to do collegiate math. Some come to us and they cannot read. More than 90% of the kids in our school are on free lunch. They come from homes well below the poverty level. The majority of the students in the demographic that we serve in our school would, in a normal circumstance, experience almost a 75% dropout rate. And yet, this most challenging of groups that we picked, we realized we could still make an impact on. The first student lottery that we held uh, three years ago was in my office in downtown Chicago. It was on the 15th floor of a building. That night I had grandmothers, which really was the only parent figure some of those kids had, come up to me and they said, you know, I've lived my entire life two miles from here. I've never been this close to the Sears Tower and I've never been this high in a building before. And so when you heard them share their life history, you began to realize the generational trap of poverty that their families and that their neighborhoods and their communities were in. Our students are very highly motivated. They, they travel on average three hours a day to and from school. Uh, they come from all over the community. Uh, they work longer hours each day. They come in on their days off. They come in on their weekends. They spend many days throughout the summer on internships and other programs. And they do all of that because the experience inspires them. Each day, every day, from freshman through senior year, every single student in the school has two hours a day of technology classes, two hours a day of Java programming and HTML and CSS as freshmen in high school from an inner city where they maybe don't even have a computer at home. Every day in every class, we emphasize the importance of entrepreneurship and how thinking creatively and motivating people around you towards change is going to change their lot in life. And every day, each of these students experience an incredible interaction with mentors. Serious people come from all over town to spend time with these students to inspire them towards future careers. Our kids come from neighborhoods all over the city. They, they come from neighborhoods, and in some cases, they come from homes where poverty and violence and chronic low expectations abound. But at school, they build businesses. At school, they create solutions, and they set high expectations for themselves. They learn the soft skills of entrepreneurial spirit and the hard skills of a vocation. And and don't think we do all of this at the expense of basic education. In our third year, we're ahead of 96% of
of all Chicago public schools in expected gains. In fact, in some cases, our students are gaining in their knowledge at a rate of two to five times faster than any standardized test measures any other CPS student on. And it's because of the inspiration that brings them back to the school, it's because of the relevancy that we, that we correlate what they're learning in the classroom to what their future careers are going to be that we think that they're, they're moving forward. So this is an entrepreneurial school with entrepreneurial teachers and mentors, and it's fostering a generation of entrepreneurial thinkers in a community where, frankly, few entrepreneurs exist. The impact of this on those students' world is significant, but the impact of these students on our world in the future is really the big idea that I wanted to share with you tonight. Thank you.